Okay, so we're going to continue with uh, the concept of death and dying and grieving, uh, which is at the end of one's life. So when we talk about death and dying, the first thing you have to think about is um, how do you determine when a person has passed away? Uh, and the first understanding of when you have death is with brain death. So brain death refers to the lack of neurological functioning in a brain for a specific period of time. Um, that's measured through EEGs, electroencephalograms, and they would be flat. Now, there is a debate between where in the brain we would be talking about for, for brain death, some, some medical experts argue that uh, death should only include higher cortical functioning, uh, whereas others talk about uh, it also has to be in the brain stem. And um, there were cases actually that went to the Supreme Court, for example, the Terry Schiavo case, uh, where she was in a vegetative state and there was a debate whether to uh, pull her off of the uh, life support. And um, the parents argued that she was still alive, even though she was in a vegetative state. The husband argued that uh, she had no functioning uh, and that they should remove all life support. And this went all the way up to the Supreme Court and in the end, the Supreme Court decided uh, consistent with the husband and they pulled her off of life support. So um, trying to uh, deal with death is more challenging. So we have to determine when death has occurred. We have issues related to life expectancy. People are living longer so um, there's issues around quality of life versus uh, natural living. Uh, we tend to see that care for the dying tends to occur more in a hospital setting rather than um, at home like it used to be. And then we have to consider um, you know, pain and suffering and trying to minimize that as well. Now, each culture has its own value system. But most societies have either a philosophical or religious belief about death. They also have rituals around death and dying. Um, and they also view that death is not the end of existence. So there are... Um, there's something beyond death. So um, we do try and engage in de the denial of death in different ways. If you want to look at um, a great book, Ernest Becker uh, had a book called The Denial of Death, which talks about all the ways we go out of our way not to deal with death or not to embrace the fact that people die. Now, the funeral, funeral uh, industry uses uh, lifelike qualities. Uh, uh, they try and make a person look as good as possible. People use euphemisms such as uh, passing away, going to a better place rather than saying that the person died. Uh, people are constantly looking for what's referred to as the fountain of youth, trying not to age. Um, there is rejection and isolation in older adults, and there's a hope that everyone goes to heaven, and uh, the focus in medical care is to prolong life, uh, not ease suffering in general. So uh, people view death differently depending on their, their age so when we talk about childhood, uh, there is very little concept of death. 
but by adolescence, uh, individuals can understand death in the abstract, but they tend to view themselves as being immune to death. Uh, we talked earlier in the semester about some of the reckless behaviors that teenagers engage in because they believe that they're immortal. Now in adulthood, um, especially middle adulthood and late adulthood, you start to think more and more about death. Now, in terms of suicide, suicide is uh, when one uh, expedites their own, own death. So there are risk factors for suicide. So when we talk about a person might have a serious physical injury and not wanna live anymore, uh, they might feel isolated, person with serious financial problems, a person who has a history of substance use, uh, antidepressant use, we tend to see uh, these are risk factors for suicide. Uh, it's important to understand that there are cultural factors uh, and gender-based differences that exist in some societies. Uh, suicide is a taboo. So there is a pressure not to do that. We tend to see that males and females, um, if they engage in suicidal behavior, they tend to differ in how they do it. Uh, for females, it tends to be more related to overdose and pills, whereas um, males tend to be more violent acts like uh, self-inflicted gun wounds. Now, uh, the risk for suicide is very rare in childhood, but it increases in adolescence. Um, the good news is that most attempts in adolescence fail, uh, which uh, sends people into the process of exploring, well, what's going on, why? Um, there are genetic and environmental factors at play. And then um, the LGBT community, it's not clear the link there. Now, uh, when one is faced with their own death, most individuals wanna make decisions um, around that. So they wanna address any unfinished business, resolve any problems or conflicts, they want to put their or, uh, affairs in order. And we, sh we sh tend to struggle with uh, embracing and accepting death. So there is one model uh, that's fairly popular, which is called the Kubler-Ross model. The Kubler-Ross model talks about stages of dying. And... Um, I will say, even before I get into this model, uh, Kubler-Ross says it's stage-like, so you go from one to the next, you can't skip a step, you can't go backwards. But what we find is actually people do, people uh, bounce back and forth through these sta stages, and it, it's not in a linear way, like she said. So um, the first, uh, stage of Kubler-Ross's model is denial. Uh, a person denies that they're going to die. And um, this might occur in more subtle ways. Uh, it might occur in a way that if a person gets a, a, a diagnosis of a terminal illness, they might say, I want a second opinion. And saying I want a second opinion isn't you know, when you think about that, that is, isn't terrible, right? But it is an expression of denial because it's like, no, maybe the first opinion is wrong. Then uh, as one starts to embrace the fact that they are going to die, uh, there is a sense of anger, right? Why me is a very common uh, phrase at this point. Uh, bargaining is the next stage where they try and find hope or negotiation uh, as to um, how to prolong their life. So you might see people negotiating with God, saying, God, if you 
uh, allow me to live, I'm gonna do this, that, or another. Um, and when that doesn't work, they can fall into a sense of depression, deep sadness, uh, because all of the bargaining didn't work. And ultimately that results in a sense of acceptance or peace about death. <laughs> Now, um, when individuals believe that they can influence or control the uh, events of their life, they tend to be more cheerful than those who don't feel like they can control it. Uh, there's more despair and depression when people don't. Um, we talked about denial. Uh, denial can be adaptive or maladaptive. In some cases, it can provide a sense of coping or hope, but in some cases, it can uh, result in avoidance of dealing with what you need to do. So in the United States, people describe uh, dying as one of, that's often a lonely, prolonged, and painful process. Uh, oftentimes, I think we talked about it happening outside of the home. So you're sitting in either a hospital or uh, a senior care center uh, and you're sitting there, painful. So one thing that we recommend is to plan for your death, right? And this includes making a living will and giving someone power of attorney, making sure that the doctors have specific instructions about what kind of uh, care you want and discussing those desires with family members and the doctors. And I even recommend writing it down and then check your insurance plan coverage to see what is covered, what isn't. Now, um, most people prefer to pass away at home or die at home, but uh, they worry about whether it's going to be a burden to their family members, whether there's enough space to bring them in a hospital bed into the home, whether it would affect their relationships, and whether their family members have the competency to provide the medical treatments that they need. So when communicating with someone who's dying, uh, here are some pro tips. Um, establish your presence, make sure they know you're there, uh, eliminate distractions as much as possible. If you're going to be there, shut off the TV and talk to them. Don't overstay your welcome. So li limit the visit time. You may not, uh, you may not understand this, but every time there is a visitor, they feel an, a need to entertain you. Don't push them to accept it. Allow them to feel any ex uh, emotional expressions such as guilt and anger. Discuss uh, unfinished business. Uh, ask if they wanna talk to someone or see someone that they haven't seen. Uh, allow them to reminisce. Allow them to tell stories about uh, their youth and some of the good times that they had. Um, Talk when the individual wants to talk and not push yourself on them and express your sincere regard for them. So in terms of the Natural Death Act and Advanced Directive, um, it expresses a person's desires uh, regarding medical procedures that might be used to sustain life when uh, a medical situation becomes hopeless. So this is Remember how we said, uh, make sure that your <clears throat> wishes are known to the medical staff. So the Natural Death Act and Advanced Directive gives guidance to the medical community. Then we have to talk about the concept of euthanasia. So euthanasia is a very challenging one. Um, euthanasia is the process of facilitating one to pass away. Now, there are different ways that one could uh, 
express euthanasia, there's passive euthanasia, and then there's active euthanasia. Passive euthanasia is when you withhold treatments, allowing a person to die naturally. Whereas uh, active euthanasia is where you inject a lethal dose of a, a drug to facilitate the death. Now, there was in the 90s a major controversy with a doctor by the name of Dr. Kevorkian. And um, he helped many people who um, were terminally ill end their life through euthanasia, active euthanasia. And he wound up being uh, sent to prison for this. Uh, because there was no law in his state to allow him, according to his medical license, to do this. So it's a controversy. It's considered controversial. But Oregon was the first state to pass a law that allowed doctors to do what Dr. Kevorkian did, which is interesting because if he was in another state doing this, he might have been allowed to do it. And many other states have followed suit since Oregon. We also should talk about hospice and palliative care. So hospice is uh, a humanized program that's committed to making the end of life as pain-free as possible, uh, reduce anxiety, depression as possible, um, whereas palliative care is designed to re reduce suffering um, and help people die with dignity. Now, we talked about the Terry Schiavo case where it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, this brings up the concept of uh, what is a persistent vegetative state, right? So this is when you have no uh, higher order neurological function, but the uh, brainstem is still working, right? So uh, that brings up issues around um, whether the person is functional or not and whether they have the capacity to return to functioning. And the question becomes who decides? In the Terry Schiavo case, the Supreme Court ruled that the husband decided or had the capacity to decide. And we have to think about what their motives are. Uh, for example, there was um, money that would come to the husband from a life insurance policy. So the question is whether that altered uh, the decision-making of the husband. So there are a lot of things we have to decide here. All right, so should the government decide? Well, it's interesting because we see that there is a, a an imbalance between social security and pensioners, which means that there is going to be a rationing of care uh, at a certain point when there are too many people who are, uh, you know, with the baby booming generation, too many people who need care and not enough workers. So, those are issues. Now let's talk about grief and loss. So when we talk about the after death, uh, so grief tends to be um, an emotional numbness that has a whole bunch of emotional states, things like disbelief, despair, sadness, loneliness uh, that accompanies when we lose someone we love. Now, healthy grieving. Um, there are different ways that we grieve. So in Western orientations, uh, we tend to break our, our bond with the dead. Uh, and then after uh, burial, we go back to our autonomous lifestyle. Whereas in non-Western societies or collectivist societies, uh, there tends to be uh, a remain connection with the deceased. So if you've seen uh, the movie Coco, Dia de, Mu de Muerto, right? So the day of the dead, 
was an annual uh, celebration of all those individuals who passed away. Uh, and they keep them as part of the family and a family tradition. Um, now, that's a good example where uh, people maintain ties with the deceased. Now, um, we have to try and make sense of what happened. So uh, grief prov provides us a way of exploring what happened. It results in, if we go through a grieving process, uh, better adjustment, more positive experiences. Um, if it happens uh, by virtue of some kind of natural disaster or accident, we're more actively processing that. Now, when it comes to a life partner, a romantic partner, um, the grief and suffering uh, that the person who is the survivor uh, often uh, results in some kind of stress related to uh, finances, uh, potentially loneliness, psychological disorders, illness. Um, and we see that uh, Widowhood is associated with increased anxiety, especially among those who were highly dependent on their spouses or connected to their spouses, whereas there's lower anxiety around, around those spouses who didn't depend on their spouse very much. So forms of mourning, about four out of five uh, individuals who die are buried into the ground, whereas about 20% is uh, due to cremation. There's a lot of controversy around the funeral industry because they financially capitalize on one's grief and they might attempt to upsell you as it relates to the coffin, as it relates to the appearance of the deceased, as it relates to perpetual care in, in, um, in the graveyard and so forth. Uh, so there's a lot of controversy around how the funeral industry um, operates now, but the funeral itself is important to um, most people in many cultures and how we mourn is different. So uh, to give you an example, the Amish mourning period, uh, it's a family oriented society. So uh, the um, result uh, in the following things. So uh, they live the same way they went with the Amish. I'm, I'm sure you've seen this in Lancaster. They live uh, the same way that their ancestors did, uh, horse and buggy, minimal technological advances are embraced depending on the tradition of, of, of the community. Now, when a person dies, they celebrate that uh, and they accept it. Um, they notify the community and the funeral tends to be at the home and uh, the community supports the family for one year. So, uh, as it relates to Jewish mourning, it's uh, mourning is graduated. It starts very intense uh, and then becomes more flexible along the way. So the first period is Aninut, which is between death and burial, followed by Avelut, which is um, the actual mourning. Uh, and you have Shiva, which is the most intense, a seven day period where uh, you're sitting on the ground, you're not working, um, everything stops for seven days, followed by Shalosham, which is a 30 day period where uh, you're allowed to return back to society, but you can't shave, you can't listen to music, you can't go to celebrations, all to uh, stop you from removing the focus off of the person who deceased. Uh, and then when it comes to parents, uh, it's a year process where you mourn for the year, but 11 months you say something called Kaddish which is a mourner's prayer. And that is our lecture for today. So let me stop my share and we'll go from there.
All right, so let's stop the recording.